All right, so chapter 6 is on the church's apostolic. And just taking a survey poll, I'm going to grade you right now. Who's correct? To call the church apostolic means the church is based on the apostles. Ding! Correct. I think that to call the church apostolic is saying that the church relates to the apostles. Correct? Follow the apostles. The apostles are a major part of the church. Wow, four for four, period two. I think to call the church apostolic means to call it to call the church about the apostles. That's confusing. I think it has something to do with the apostles. Nice. Church was helped formed by the apostles, refers to the role of the apostles. This is this is a lot better. I had a class yesterday that only a quarter of them got it right. Um Established by the apostles. It means that anyone in the church can be a worker of God. Incorrect. Um, originally run by the apostles. We're connected to the apostles, in other words. The church is whole. To be like the apostles. Okay, this person's getting to the second meaning of the word apostolic. That one's wrong. I think it means to, it has apostles in it, and we believe in the apostles. Pretty good. Pretty good. Um you, uh, you're half correct. Um, you know, if you got the whole thing correct, I wouldn't have to teach you. But um, you know, for those of you that go to Catholic Mass um, for the hopefully the rest of your life, you're going to stand every Sunday and say, "I believe in one holy Catholic Apostolic Church," and that's a big statement. And I want you to to know that full well, which is why you're getting a full midterm from me. Um, cause it's, it's, it's that important. So apostolic implies, as most of you know, or recognize connected to the apostles coming from the apostles. And to say that we in 2022 are apostolic means that we have to remember that we were built off of these 12 men. That's the answer to your first Bible bell ringer question. The church is built off of the foundation of the apostles. Everything started with 12 weak, sinful men, the leader of which betrayed Jesus three times. You know, um, So we're going to first talk about um, what does it mean to be an apostle. Um, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm going to bounce around a little bit here. Um, it comes from the Greek word apostoli, meaning an emissary. Emissary is not a commonly used word. And so I would suggest um, we're going to change out emissary with a similar word, a uh, missionary. To be an apostle is to be on a mission, to be given a mission, to be sent on a mission. So that's what the word means. The apostle is one who is sent, sent out. Jesus was the first apostle. As you see from the catechism, Jesus is the Father's emissary. So God the Father sent Jesus into the world to save us, to go preach the good news, to go come and redeem us, etc., etc. From the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he called to him those whom he desired, and he appointed twelve, whom he named apostles to be with him and to be sent out to preach from then on. They would be his emissaries. So Jesus passes the baton in 12 directions. In them, Christ continues his own mission. And Jesus has very powerful words about him passing this baton. Uh, there's two quotes from Scripture here. Jesus says, As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when Jesus says that, what, what he's saying is, you are me in the world. And this is God talking to sinful humans. Like what a big charge he's giving his 12 apostles. Um, so he identifies with his apostles. The apostles' ministry is a continuation of his own mission. Jesus says to them another time, He who receives you receives me. And he also goes on to say that he who rejects you rejects me. You know, um, so, you know, they are, you know, 
successful missions. There are uh, unsuccessful missions. Jesus prepares his apostles for both. You know, you're going to be received, you're going to be rejected. Um, but the important thing is that you know that it is I who am sending you. And so we have to go, you know, and the apostles have to respond. And in doing so, they, they begin the work of the church at Pentecost. All right. Um, let me uh, explain why I put this particular picture up on the board. This is St. Peter, and you see his boat there. He's got a little pea rogue. His boat is uh, overflowing with fish. You might remember this story. I showed you a little movie clip about it. Um, and it was actually kind of referenced in this past week's gospel. But Peter is fishing all night, remember? He's tired. Jesus says, why don't you just put down your net another time on the other side of the boat, maybe. Try that. And he actually, Peter somehow uh, cooperates with Jesus, fills up his boat with fish, and Peter says, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. To which Jesus says, don't worry, you're not going to be catching fish anymore, you'll be catching men. As in to say, don't worry about your problems or your sins. Um, just follow me. And this is another uh, important part the Catechism talks about in being an apostle. Jesus unites these apostles to the mission he received from the Father. We just said that. As the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but receives everything from the Father who sent him, so those whom Jesus sends can do nothing apart from him. For they receive both the mandate Mandate meaning the order, go and preach the good news, go and baptize all nations, and they get the power. They get the strength. They get the inspiration. They get two things in being an apostle. When you're an apostle, you don't, if you want to be a fruitful apostle, you're not going to be an apostle or a missionary um, all on your own. When you bring Jesus into somebody's life, you need to have Jesus in your own life. And you know that, that Jesus is in your life simply because he's merciful and generous. So you don't go bringing your own wisdom and knowledge, but the power of Jesus Christ. You know, I've experienced this many times in my ministry where I have to pray for a long time before I, I go give a talk or whatnot. Because, you know, if we just say our own words, do our own things, uh, it, it's it's not going to bear abundant fruit. <laughs> the same way that, as this paragraph says, Jesus, the Son, came and the Father provided everything for him and gave him the guidance and the direction on what to do. So we need all of that from Jesus. And you need to stay plugged into Jesus if you're going to be an apostle, which is what Lesson 2 is about. But when you read stories about how miserable kind of the apostles were, um how selfish they seemed at times uh, and you know how weak Peter was of course denying Jesus three times um, all of this is allowed by God so that we rely more on his grace and his power than than our own wisdom and knowledge all right so that's what um, it looks like to be an apostle it is uh, of course being sent by God uh, into the world but then always needing to rely back on him to bring his grace into the world all right um, this office of the apostles who handed uh, their authority on to other men is permanent and it remains in the church today but only in the Catholic Church only the Catholic Church has true successors to the apostles and most every Protestant will actually recognize this we recognize that um, you know Peter handed on the keys to somebody else, and, and the, this process continues until the end of time. Uh, this is what Jesus promised, I'll be with you always. He's talking to the church when he says that, and um, you know, he basically says, try to stay together as one family. And so the apostles would appoint successors. I taught you a little bit about how even before Pentecost happened, the apostles um, said, we got to replace Judas. Judas killed himself. So what we need to do is we need to go find somebody else. And so they elect Matthias uh, to be the successor of Judas. 
and this is all happening even before Pentecost, the idea of passing the baton to the next group of, of men was very evident, um, even in the Bible. And that's what it means to call the church apostolic. It means that we're connected. I have a, a short story, but I was walking in Karen Crow uh, when my wife and I were dating. We, we both lived in Karen Crow up North University. And I forget where we were walking on North University, but there was this little Protestant church that invited us in. They were having some meeting. And I said, okay. And they went on preaching about their church to us. Um, and they kept saying, oh, we're apostolic. You want to know why we're apostolic? Because we live like the apostles. We live just like they would live today. And that was how why they called their church apostolic. Because they know that the term apostolic is in the Nicene Creed. And you have to be apostolic. But every Protestant church broke off of the family tree, right? And, and they, uh, they, they've done their own thing. And, but now they say that they're apostolic because they act like the apostles, which is, of course, debatable. And they say it doesn't matter if you're in the line of the apostles. All that matters is if you act like the apostles. The problem with that, other than separating and dividing the church, is that how do you know if you're actually living like the apostles? You're your own judge. You are your own rule maker. And so uh, it's very important uh, to maintain the, the fullness of the truth, to, to be in with the successors of the apostles. As I said today, these are, and I'm going to write this on the board because most of you forgot it. These are the bishops, okay, if you haven't written that down yet. What did this look like? Right after Pentecost, we get a powerful verse in Acts 2 about the four things that the church committed itself to. And this was your second bell ringer. Number one, it says that this early community, this church family, dedicated themselves to the teaching of the apostles. You know, another way that the church is apostolic. Founded on the apostles, listening to the apostles. When, a bit, when your bishop says something, you honor it and you respect it and you, um, you, know, you fall into that government of the church that we talked about last chapter. Acts 2 says they gave themselves to the communal life. They lived for each other. They didn't live on an island. In the early church, if you came across a lot of money, you shared that money. If you came across a lot of food, you shared that food. Um, and you, you couldn't you didn't keep anything to yourself. Everybody shared, everybody leaned on each other. Um, very tight, very sacrificial community that we don't often experience in America because so many of us are well provided for. But um, that level of community support was very central in the early church. They would break bread. Um, of course, that's the Eucharist. They gave themselves to the sacraments. And they had their own certain prayers that they would all pray together, formal prayers that helped unite them. Um, all this is built off of the apostles, the first point, which is the main point that I want you to get. All right. The church is apostolic in the line of the apostles. We call them bishops today, and, and they help organize the, the very life of the church. You find this most fully in the Catholic church. All right. That's the lesson for today.